This is the Farm Monitor. For over 50 years, your source for agribusiness news and features from around the southeast and across the country. Focusing on one of the nation's top industries, agriculture. The Farm Monitor is produced by one of the largest general farm organizations, the Georgia Farm Bureau. Now here are your hosts, Ray D'Alessio and Kenny Bergamy. That's right, we are your host and it's our job to bring you all the latest happenings in Georgia agriculture. Hi everybody, so glad you could join us for this week's edition of the Farm Monitor. I'm Ray D'Alessio. And I'm Kenny Bergamy. Straight ahead on the program, travel with us to Perry for the annual Georgia Cattlemen's Conference. Hear for yourself what members are doing to meet the increasing demand of quality local beef. And when buying that beef, wouldn't it be cool to see exactly where it came from, when it was processed, and the road it traveled to get from the farm to your table? Well, that technology is in the works, and we're going to tell you all about it. Plus, well, hey everybody, Ranger Nick, coming up, I'm hanging out in Forsyth, Georgia at a diversified livestock operation of the scaly variety. I'm going to introduce you to a farmer who's using reptiles in his farming operation. I'll be the investigator. That and so much more starts right now on the Farm Monitor. It's that time of the year again, time for the Georgia Cattlemen Association's annual convention and trade show. Now in its 58th year, the convention is a great way for producers all over the state to come together and learn about the latest and greatest equipment, but also learn about what they may be facing in the upcoming year. John Holcomb was in Perry for that event and has the story. Just like in past years, the annual Georgia Cattlemen's Convention was a big hit as producers from all over the state come together. It's a jam-packed three-day event that gives producers the chance to learn about new technology and learn about what's happening in the Georgia beef industry. This is one of the largest gathering of cattle producers in the state. This is where we uh, were able to provide educational opportunities as well as fellowship opportunities. We've got plenty of vendors here, we've got cattle sales going on, and so this is really a, a great point for an individual farmer or rancher to come in and see what's, what is available, maybe learn a little bit, and enjoy the uh, camaraderie and fellowship with our other cattle producers. Aside from getting the fellowship and see the latest and greatest equipment, the convention also serves as a learning opportunity for Georgia cattle producers, something that's of utmost importance in an ever-changing industry. This is a great opportunity for cattlemen from across the state of Georgia to come in and, and learn about the cattle industry and, and learn about the new techniques that's got out there as far as vaccination programs and, uh, and also cattle health and well-being. Uh, it's also a great opportunity to come in and see the new types of hay equipment that's on the market and different types of working facilities for cattle operations. The importance of education on techniques and more efficient production can't be expressed enough, especially when Georgia beef is competing with beef markets all over the world. In the cattle industry today, we're such a, uh, we're on a world trade organization competitive market. And uh, so we have to compete with everybody in the world. So the better we can stay in tune, in tune with the new technology and new vaccines and stuff, the better all we are being more efficient with cattle and, and being more efficient with our time and labor to make us more competitive and, and, uh, and also to produce a better product. Another aspect of the convention is how it gives producers an update on the Georgia cattle industry in terms of what the Georgia Cattlemen's Association and the Georgia Beef Board are doing for them in Washington as well as in Atlanta. These events are important for cattle producers mainly because we're able to, uh, we're stronger together than we ever are apart. And so while you may not have the ability, the time, the money or energy to, uh, to go and advocate on behalf of your, yourself, the Georgia Cattlemen's Association is here to do that for you. And so we're, uh, we're willing to work with you and want to work with you in order to, to make the cattle industry better and to continue the legacy that, that we have of raising cattle in Georgia. In order for that legacy to continue, it's important to have someone advocating at all times, working to educate those that are making decisions on issues that they may or may not know about. A lot of things that's happening on your farm is controlled by people outside of the fence rows of your farm. And, uh, and, and the Georgia Cattlemen's Association is that organization that's going to go out and represent you on issues that affect us every day. And, uh, and being coming to these type of events or going to any of our cattle meetings, the local chapter meetings, gives you that opportunity to uh, have an input in it and also learn things that can make your operation better. Reporting in Perry for the Farm Monitor, I'm John Holcomb. All right, John, thank you so much. Now, meantime, it's a technology mostly used in the healthcare and financial industries. Talking about blockchain technology. 
It provides unmatched security to record keeping systems and now it is something one company is looking to bring to the ag industry by incorporating it into a cattle traceability program. Damon Jones shows us how it can be beneficial to both the farmer and the consumer. Between farm to table restaurants, farmers markets and even the Georgia Grown program, it's becoming more and more common to let consumers know where their food is coming from. It's a growing trend that one company is certainly taking notice of. We felt like, or we see a, a market that is uh, developing today where consumers want to know more about the animal, about the food they're feeding their children, about the food they're consuming. That's why Kelly Products in Covington is working on a new traceability system for cattle producers. It's a program that tracks the animal throughout its life cycle and gives that information to the shopper. So we're going to be able to trace the product from birth right now all the way to where it's a hamburger in a store where the consumer can actually type in a code, find out who the farmer was that raised the, prop, raised the beef, uh, everything about his life cycle. They want to know the important facts. It just gives them uh, complete traceability all the way through the animal's life cycle. And to make sure the information isn't compromised, the system uses blockchain technology, which is shown to provide unparalleled security in other business sectors. Uh, nowadays we're using it for all sorts of other technology where we want to be able to track everything from medical records to, in this case, you know, data about the you know, events that have happened you know, to an animal throughout its life. Uh, without that data ever being able to be edited or modified by somebody you know, after the fact. So people can, uh, through an app that is designed and developed in a purpose that can enter data, but it cannot be deleted or uh, edited or retrieved by only those people that are given access to it. So while the benefits of this new blockchain system are fairly obvious for the consumers, there's plenty of things for the farmers to be excited about as well, including the ease of use and getting real-time data right on their smartphone. It's going to give them a, an easy tracking system, an app, where they can track their animal's weight gains, uh, they can keep up with vaccinations, they can keep up with birth weights. Uh, they can track all the way down to the end product and see what the animal produced. All that information, which is tracked through an RFID chip placed in the cow's ear, can increase the farmer's productivity while also increasing the value of their product. So he's tracking the, the quality of the animal he's producing, He's seeing which sires are producing better animals. He can increase the, the value. Uh, secondarily for that producer, we're hoping that uh, and believe that the consumer today is willing to pay a little more for that transparency. The retailer or the consumer can know with the integrity of the blockchain concept where that animal came from, who the farmer was, how he treats his animals, that uh, ultimately the consumer is going to be liable to pay more for that product, just like they pay more for organic lettuce and carrots. And prices aren't the only thing farmers hope to increase, as all this transparency could also build the trust of consumers. He'll meet his farmer, he'll know the farmers, he'll understand the, the life cycle the animal went through, uh, he'll understand that the animal was raised with, you know, good practices in place. Reporting from Covington, I'm Damon Jones for the Farm Monitor. In the meantime, another Georgia Farm Bureau Women's Leadership Conference is now in the books. This year's conference held at Callaway Gardens in Pine Mountain, Georgia. Great time, lots of fellowship. Its purpose, of course, to help educate teachers, county offices, and Farm Bureau volunteers so they can go back out to their communities and counties and teach ag in a way to make it fun and enjoyable. The most important thing, I think, is what they gain from it. They learn so much from the workshops. They get so many resources to take back, to use, and that's our impetus to uh, promote ag literacy. We want every child in the state of Georgia to know about agriculture. The members here feel like this conference was of value to them, and the goal is next year to have more people in attendance and they understand the importance of promotion education committees and the women's leadership committees and that this conference gets larger and larger each year as we keep doing it. The National STEM Academy in Warner Robins has officially opened their state-of-the-art outdoor classroom. Powered by self-sustainable energy sources like solar panels and wind turbines, the new classroom will allow students to receive some practical experience in a curriculum that focuses on renewable energy, water conservation, and soil erosion. 
whenever we do hands-on math and science, it's really going to create memorable experiences and help the students really understand why it's important to learn about the earth and to recycle materials and, and try to use renewable energies. When we teach about solar energy and use the solar panels, we can show the students how we can create our own electricity and, and just measures that can help save the earth in the long run. Hey everybody, Ranger Nick coming up. I'm hanging out with this guy and Wesley at a farming operation where alligators are involved in controlling waste. I hope I survive. See you in a minute. My name is Cora Kieber. I am the Director of Education at the State Botanical Garden of Georgia. We are sitting in the Alice H. Richards Children's Garden. Our grand opening was March 23rd. This is one of the most magnificent, in my opinion, children's gardens that I have ever seen. It shares the story of the natural history of Georgia, the wonderful resources that our state provides, both agriculturally and also from the mountains through the Piedmont to the coast. In 2008, the State Botanical Garden of Georgia received a gift in honor of Alice H. Richards from the Richards family. Their mother was one of our board members um, for many, many years, and she had written a handwritten letter to one of her friends talking about how excited she was about the children's garden. It's been sitting on the master plan for 30 years, and when we received the gift, we were able to start the process of building so this has been in progress since 2008. In 2012, we hired our first firm where we were able to come up with the schematic designs of the different galleries that we wanted to see. We developed a philosophy statement with, um, developed by the education team at the time where we came up with a vision, a mission statement, and several guiding principles. The guiding principles are nature as teacher, the second one is using science, math, art, and literacy education to connect to nature and also healthy me, healthy body, healthy community, healthy earth. If I'm healthy, my community's healthy. If my community's healthy, the earth is healthy. I guess the best way to say why people are so attracted to nature is we are a part of our surroundings. And so it's important to know where we come from and what connects us, what keeps us living, what keeps us going. Our plants is what we eat, the air that we breathe, the water that we drink. It is part of who we are. Really cool place. Well, speaking of cool in UGA, in the six years he's been a contributor to the Farm Monitor, Ranger Nick has conquered many things. Venomous snakes, aggressive owls, cave-dwelling bats, wild horses. The list is lengthy. Well, now he can add gators to that list. Fitting for someone who received his Ph.D. from a particular school in Gainesville, Florida. Well, working for the University of Georgia, there's no doubt I've been told it's not a good idea often to talk about alligators in the context of my job. Bulldogs and gators have never gotten along very well, but this month I'm going to introduce you to someone who does take care of alligators in the process of diversified livestock, and I'm hanging out at his farm, Wesley Ham. So good to meet you. Glad to have you here. Oh my gosh, Georgia Outstanding Young Farmer of the Year right here, 2017. This is going to be incredible. This month we're standing in front of a bunch of alligators, and Wesley told me he was going to bring me to his chicken operation. Wesley, how did I end up in this room full of alligators on a chicken farm? What happened? So this is a pretty important process of making use of something that generally we would just throw away and would be a dead cost to us. So we take a product that uh, historically we dug a hole and buried it. And dead now chickens? We're, absolutely. Okay, okay. The mortality that is naturally occurring in producing the chicken that we eat. And uh, we try to keep that to a minimum. Yeah. But it still occurs, so we take that and we turn it into something that's value added and, 
and, and don't waste that product. Which now I have to ask, and the folks at home may be wondering, how did you get into this? How did this start? You said we have chicken waste, these carcasses, what are we gonna do with them? And you said alligators are the answer. How did this start? So I guess it's a creative thought on the part of my grandmother and my uncle combined. And, nice. and uh, through multiple generations of ingenuity, this is where we arrived. And, wow. And For we how continued long? to probably 18 years now. Incredible. Right out here, you've got alligators that you're growing. When they come here, are they this size? Which by the way, they're up to about five feet long. They're pretty good size. And five feet is how old? Uh, it can range from 14 months to 30 months. Oh my gosh, so still young guys, they come here at what size? So we get gators about 500 at six inches long. Wow. And uh, the target size is six feet, and it takes anywhere from 14 to 16 months up to three years. It's a variable growth rate. And Interesting. They get that size, then they're moved somewhere else for hide and for meat and those kind of things. Exactly. Yep. Now, I have to know, how are you moving these guys? And I want to talk about that next. How do you get them into a truck to move them somewhere for the harvesting part? So I'd like to get up close and personal. Let's do that together next, okay? So this fella right over here in the corner, Wesley's giving us the evil eye. I want to move this along a little bit. Folks, I want to talk about how Wesley gets these guys from his farm into a truck off to where they get to go. And he's not using one of these. You would think that one would use one of these nooses to catch them. Wesley would prefer using his hands. Wesley, I'm going to sit this down over here. I have been given a roll of tape, and I think that's a really good thing. I imagine what he's going to use this tape for, and not to tape my mouth, but something else's mouth. Wesley, how are we going to get one of these? Well, Nick, first off, it's nice to have some 10 fingered help. And we're going to go uh, into this little group of gators here in the corner. Okay. And I'm coming with I like you. to okay. position them as they get to this bigger size between my legs. Okay. And uh, ideally, you want to kind of avoid the mouths of too many other gators. Mm -hmm. Always I'll important. I like the tail end myself. Grab the scoots kind of behind their legs. Those scales. Those pull scoots. the mouth to the surface. Okay. And then just. Grab the mouth, kind of right. lock my fingers. Okay, I've got my tape right underneath here. Underneath the jaw. Wesley, I'm gonna lay the tape, not over his nostril, but right around there. I'm gonna wrap it a few times here. Just and a few, and then it. pull it shut. Thanks, pal, okay. All right, look at this beauty. Look at this, oh, there he goes. You cannot imagine the power. So Wesley, holding on to this guy. This is just over a year old. The power here, the tail. Wesley's got down between his legs holding this. Wesley, this fella, beautiful. This fella is then going off, what are they used for? So the primary value is the hide. Okay. But then the meat, as far as the legs, the okay. ribs, the tail, beautiful. is also marketed. Interesting, beautiful animal right here. I wanna talk now, we're gonna put this guy back, untape him, let him go back to his business. I wanna talk now about the sustainability end of this and how extension is involved in helping Wesley with this is incredible stuff. Let's let this fella go and thank him. Beautiful guy, crazy. All right, so I stepped out of the alligator pen there. I'm outside drying off, and I want to introduce you to somebody that is a great collaborator with Wesley. And y'all know I'm a big fan of Georgia Extension, and I'm going to introduce you to the Ag and Natural Resource Extension agent right here in Monroe County, Caitlin Bennett-Jackson. Caitlin, thanks so much for being out here. Caitlin, what is your role in helping Wesley and others like Wesley with issues they have with agriculture? Well, Nick, we're super glad to have you out in Monroe County, and I think that I probably have the coolest job because I get to work with farmers, homeowners, and youth in Monroe County and provide agricultural education. Uh, a lot of these services are free, if not very low cost. Yeah, and here's the thing. So many folks at home might not know that in their county you have an extension agent, an ag agent, a 4-H agent, a family and consumer science agent that's there to help, often and most of the time free of charge, university expertise right here. Caitlin, thanks so much for being out here with us. And Wesley, thank you so much. I'm so glad I have all my fingers. <laughs> Everything is still fine. The power of those gators was incredible. I have so much more respect for Steve Irwin now than I ever had before. Y'all, thank you so much for hanging out with us today. Y'all know what to do. When you're online checking out the YouTube videos of this segment, don't forget to check out the Farm Monitor Facebook page. And while you're there, scoot on over to the Ranger Nick Facebook page and like that, see what I've got going on in my world. And until next time, for the Farm Monitor, I'm Ranger Dick, reminding you, as always, that enthusiasm is contagious. So pass it on. Y'all, thanks so much for watching. And there's only one thing left to say. See you later, alligator. Nick, thanks so much. Now, don't forget, if you missed any part of Ranger Nick's story or others on today's program, you can see them in their entirety at our YouTube channel, The Farm Monitor. 
the archive growing day by day. In fact, it dates back to 2009. When we come back, vets using 3D printing to create replicas of bones and rehearse surgeries before actually working on an animal. Sheffield, beautiful briny sea, and this is our gunpowder finishing salt, which won the overall grand prize. We are a dry goods company. We have sea salt, sugar blends. Since this is salt, and it would be kind of weird to say, here, taste some salt, um, we made a cauliflower bisque with local cauliflower, and we made it as bland as possible, and just added gunpowder finishing salt, and that all the flavor translated. You know, having these small local artisans and farmers have a way to be able to showcase their products um, and, and get their products out there through a competition of this nature, I think is such a very unique thing. It just turns into one of the biggest marketing opportunities that they've experienced. Just being in the presence of makers, getting to interact with the judges, getting to interact with the whole Georgia grown um, faculty and the University of Georgia Ag Extension. Personally, I think that the, the level and the quality of the products just continues to increase. The way that everyone are, is really trying to do a fantastic job of incorporating Georgia-grown ingredients into their products is really, really amazing. Well, finally this week, there's a new high-tech way veterinarians are helping our animal friends heal from sickness and injury. As Charles Denny reports, experts are using three-dimensional models to visualize surgeries and practice healing methods before laying a hand on the patient. Healing through technology, an artificial bone at a time. Coming to life first on a screen, the UT College of Veterinary Medicine takes an image like this of a dog's skull. Then using three-dimensional printing, veterinarians can create a model you can hold in your hand and study. Here's a time lapse as this technology creates a canine tibia. Yeah, I mean, on an everyday basis, we visualize things in three dimensions. Orthopedic surgeon Kyle Snowden says 3D technology is changing veterinary medicine. Here they demonstrate the system, first drawing up a power T on screen, and then the printer will need about 50 minutes to make it. When veterinarians are able to use this technology to replicate bone structure, it allows them to rehearse a tricky surgery. And we maybe only have, you know, a tenth of a millimeter between having a good outcome and having a poor outcome. I, I want to try to do that surgery, you know, a couple times before I actually do it on the patient. And so 3D printing gives me that option. Uh, without causing any pain, any significant trauma to, to the patient I'm working on. Veterinarians also use this technology to correct limb deformities in animals, illustrated here by this dog's left leg. Using 3D printing and model building, surgeons were able to correct the bone structure, shown in the next photos. Before this technology, vets relied on x-rays and CT scans to plan treatments, but those only gave you two dimensions of images. 3D printing gives you new information about the injury and the surrounding delicate tissue. UTCVM also trains veterinarians, and experts believe use of 3D will become a standard practice for future vets. And so having the ability to actually hold the bone and to feel the little bony prominences and all the anatomical landmarks uh, can just, you know, aid in that learning process so much more. Look for UTCVM to expand use of 3D printing and these helpful models. When you can create a better understanding of a problem, see it and touch it before going any further, that will likely improve the outcome for the patient. This is Charles Denny reporting. Great job, Charles. Very interesting stuff. And unfortunately, that is going to do it for this week's edition of the Farm Monitor. Now, here's a reminder for all the latest ag info regarding food, great recipes, and what's happening out on the farm. Be sure you check out our Twitter, Facebook, and Pinterest pages. You'll stay informed and see what's up in the world of farming, plus with us here on the show. Take care, everybody. We'll see you next week right here on the Farm Monitor. As always, have a great week.